The United Kingdom, in common with the rest of the European Union, will not recognize the Crimea referendum that took place yesterday as legal or legitimate or uh, meaningful. That is pretty representative of what most in the international community are saying with respect to the referendum that took place in Crimea. Voted 97% overwhelmingly in favor of being part of Russia. And now just before we came back to you, there is some breaking news that uh, President Vladimir Putin has signed an order in response to the U.S. and international community recognizing Crimea as a sovereign state. I'm going to bring in my next guest. He is Stavros Arugas, and he has been in an international um, election observer for a number of years, Stavros. Thanks very much for being here. So I'm curious how you respond to, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but sort of this breaking news that um, that Putin has signed this order and said, all right, we're going to recognize Crimea as a sovereign nation. He's up the ante. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in blunt terms, he keeps pushing forward on full annexation of Crimea because the, the game is, is he going to fully annex Crimea or is he gonna create kind of a de facto state and control it? So the control of Crimea is not in question. I mm -hmm. think it, the West has kind of uh, abandoned the idea of getting full control back to Crimea. Okay. So this is continuing on the path to it becoming part of the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. And he wants to call these bluffs. And the question only is, how f will he go all the way? And then what's the pushback to that? Okay, okay. so these, these recent actions that we're now seeing today are in response to what everyone is saying, uh, Stavros, is an illegal, illegitimate referendum. Um, you have been an election observer three times in Ukraine. You've been in Kazakhstan. You've been in some very contentious and hot spots around the world. Walk us through how something like this would work, because we're hearing 90% voter turnout, 97% voting in favor of this. I, I think as short of there being one name or one question on the ballot, those are pretty extraordinary numbers. Yeah, I mean, the legitimacy of the, the whole referendum was always questioned, and the results of it show that it is illegitimate. Mm -hmm. So I think there isn't, there isn't much question about that. Now, I use an analogy. I was involved in a presidential election in Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. which has essentially an authoritarian leader since the fall of the Soviet Union. Right. And he had four other candidates. And there, so there are five of them. And he essentially would have got 75% of the vote, I mm -hmm. bet. But the person told me, I'm a, so you got 91%, because that shows that we're strong. Okay. So the notion of numbers is kind of thrown out. Like 80% would be strong, but they, they jack it up to the point that we consider ridiculous. Mm -hmm. to sh they consider that maybe internally a show of strength. Yeah. And the fact is, with this large voter turnout, that we know a lot of the Tatars and the and ethnic Ukrainians didn't vote that it seems a bit ridiculous that there would have been that many people that actually voted. So which tells you that's probably not the case. Okay. So with um, with respect to, because a lot of questions, look, we have over 1.8 Canadians, a part of the Ukrainian uh, diaspora here in Canada. This matters to us. Our prime minister is going over there in, in about a week. Our foreign affairs minister has been over there. Canada has been at the forefront with respect to initialize, um, putting the initial sanctions upon um, Russia and, and Ukraine and, and all of the like. So I'm curious, though, how um, people observe this just outside. A lot of Ukrainians at home here in Canada sort of think, why aren't we doing more? Why aren't we saying more? But short of, uh, you know, Ukraine's not part of NATO, so that if there was a, an issue there, they'd be an automatic NATO inter intervention. But we've already said we're not going to put troops on the ground. We've already said that. So where do we move from here? Well, the sanctions are the first step. They're trying to up the ante on the sanctions. But the idea is it's kind of that carrot and stick idea. Mm -hmm. If you use all your sticks immediately, you know, where you're trying to get to. So at every time Putin ups the ante, there's going to be has more sanctions. And it was just been doing. Weeks. And yeah. I mean, to my surprise, mm -hmm. I and mean, when I came on before thinking that there might be that compromise move, if he doesn't actually annex the region, right. there might be a way for him to get something out. Because there's a lot of pushback for him. You're going to destroy certain. Uh, pillars of the economy in the long term. Mm -hmm. it'll, 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 it'll take time. But as far as these sanctions go, when they start to hit people a bit wider, maybe some of the oligarchs, maybe some of the people yes. that like, the, the, there's a reference that some of the wives, some of the oligarchs is kind of a joke that, you know, they, they spend a lot of money, it's in Paris. Mm -hmm. So if those people start to get hit, but it's a bit tricky because 
who is responsible. You know, you don't throw sanctions against everybody. Uh, but that's the path that's heading down. And that's really not good for anybody, but there probably isn't much choice. Yeah, I, I think that's really where part of it is. We're seeing some of that direct attack, shall we say, economic attack on some of those oligarchs. So they will be looking at who is very much propping up Putin um, financially targeting them and then and then that ostensibly having a trickle down effect for the average um, Russian citizen. But I truly believe watching how Putin has handled all of this, former KGB agent, he thinks that the collapse of the Soviet Union was one of the worst um, events in history. He wants to rebuild that strong um, empire yet again and piece by piece trying to take certain parts of Russia or t take parts of Ukraine and other parts of Europe just sort of buttresses that and we are sitting on our hands. I, I guess he's just going to keep calling our bluff. Is that is that all we have to look for here at this point, Stavros? Well, the idea is that if he's going to move beyond Crimea, there's talk that he's, you know, in a certain village there that has some strategic interest around a pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, and any move beyond Crimea, again, just pushes up the ante that, you know, you're going to try to avoid uh, some kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. The trick is, how does that look? How does that shape up? I mean, the Ukrainian forces are so weak that He's it's it's hard to say exactly what's happened, but the idea that the, the status quo is going to work is not. This is definitely moving forward. Mm -hmm. The question is, in the next few weeks, where is it going to go? I, I think a lot of people, myself included, didn't know if you'd even get this far. Um, the pushback is so great for him in the long term and the medium term mm -hmm. that you have to wonder what he's thinking at points. But in the short term, the Russian people and many Russian speakers around the world, even here in Canada, mm -hmm support this okay. but when there's a blowback on the economy and it hits their wallets that's you watch out change. all right appreciate your thoughts thanks very much thank you stavros rugas is my guest here joining me in our toronto studio he's been an election observer for a number of years including observing three elections in ukraine